Heavenly Father, as we start this Sabbath day of study, we ask that your Holy Spirit and angels would be here with us in attendance. We ask that you would enlighten our mind by this presence and that we would understand what you have for us and that all that was spoken from up front would be true and honest and for um, the edification of your saints. We ask that the human thoughts that I may have would be set aside, that um, you could use uh, this humble servant to convey ideas that are important for you to be conveyed, and that as we hear these things, that you would touch our hearts and minds, that we would receive these truths in the way that you intended them to be received. And I ask that you would once again challenge us all to be the Bereans that we've been called to be, that we would um, hear what is spoken today, but take up the responsibility of testing these things through our own prayer and study um, at the first opportunity. And we thank you for this Sabbath once again and ask now that you would bless these meetings. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Last night, um, we began this particular series. Um, the first presentation, we went over some basic principles of Bible prophecy. Um, if you weren't here last night, you will find the notes that we referred to in this um, booklet. And uh, some of the principles that we set forth we're going to refer to in a matter-of-fact fashion as we proceed because we've already went over them. Um, in the second presentation, we took up the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, for those of you that were here last night, if you notice, after we got through the notes of last night's presentation, you'll see a section called Appendix to Number Two, Parallel Lines of Prophecy. I included this passage, which I'm calling the Appendix. It's just one passage from the Great Controversy 424 through 431. And the reason that I put this passage in here, if you take time to read it, I know you've read it before, but in presentation number one last night, we dealt with the fact that prophecy is portrayed upon a timeline. The timeline goes down towards the end of the world, has a direction to it, and that historical events are what demonstrate the fulfillment of prophecy, and these historical events are illustrated on this timeline as it goes down to the end of the world. That was the definition we identified of what prophecy is. Then we looked at several passages where Sister White speaks about the lines of prophecy in the book of Daniel are taken up in the line of Revelation. And of course, we looked at the passage in the Bible where it's speaking about how to develop truth. It says line upon line, here a little, there a little. We are emphasizing that prophetic histories, prophetic lines of history, the work of a student of prophecy is to bring these lines together. And as you bring these lines together, uh, the picture of this prophetic truth becomes clearer and clearer. And the first line of prophecy that we dealt with last night was the parable of the ten virgins. And we're going to take some other lines of prophecy this morning that are the same history. They're the same prophetic line, only they're coming at it from a different prophetic angle. And we're going to bring them together, overlaying them upon one another to develop the information that took place in 1840 to 44 when the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled. But in this passage from the Great Controversy, which is the appendix, as you read through there, note how many different places in Bible prophecy that Sister White connects with the history of 1840 to 44. Um, you'll see that, that there are several Places just in this one passage. I'm not saying I'm not suggesting that all the passages in the Bible that are an illustration of 1840 to 44 are in this section in the Great Controversy, but as you read through that, you're going to see many, many other places in Scripture that we've been told that this this prophetic history. As an example, um, she refers to Malachi, the the messenger of the covenant coming suddenly to his temple. You know that that passage in Malachi. The Sister White is very clear that the messenger of the covenant that came suddenly to his temple is describing when Christ entered into the most holy place 
1844. So if you're going to understand the conclusion of the history of 1840 to 44, you also need to take the prophetic line of history that's located in Malachi and bring it into that history. It's these different lines that we bring together to develop the full picture. So that, that's why that's a, that appendix is there. It's just a very good passage um, illustrating um, several different places in God's word that have a direct connection to the Millerite time period. And why are we talking about the Millerite time period? Uh, because when Sister White's speaking about the Millerite time period perfectly fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins, she says that this parable will be fulfilled again to the very letter. The Millerite time period is illustrating the time period of the 144,000. In our first presentation last night, the, the title of the first presentation I think was Jesus Christ the First and the Last. The one thing I wanted to emphasize in that first presentation, which I really ran, ran out of time because I left the, the verses to for the punchline at the end and I ran out of time to, to emphasize it, is that one of the characteristics that is the one characteristic that is the, the most emphasized in Revelation chapter 1 of Christ, which he chose to emphasize of himself, was that he's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And the closer you look at God's word, you'll find that over and over again, Christ, in, in, in various ways, includes um, his signature on different passages by connecting the beginning of a thought, a beginning of a truth, the beginning of a prophecy with the end of a prophecy. And it's, it's not simply that he places the history at the beginning of a time prophecy parallels the history at the end. There are other ways that this takes place. And we wanted to put that as the foundation of our studies for this weekend because that's what we're saying about the Millerite time period. In agreement with Sister White, Sister White says the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. We're suggesting that the end of Adventism is illustrated by the beginning of Adventism. And one quote I told you when we touched on last night, there was a quote where Sister White emphasizes that when we see something in God's word repeated and repeated, the more it's repeated, the more emphasis that inspiration is putting upon it, the more importance it has. And brothers and sisters, the history of the Millerite time period, I don't understand. There's no way a, a human being could know all the places in God's word where that history is illustrated. But myself, I know it, it's over 20 places that I can go to in, in the Bible where the Millerite time period is illustrated. So it's, it's in there over and over and over again. I mean, a variety of ways. There is a great importance. In fact, it may be, it's got to be one of the, the prophetic histories in God's word that is right up in the top as far as, as repetition. It is Brothers and sisters, let's face it. The climax of the gospel in terms of human beings having, having the opportunity to receive salvation, the climax of that 6,000 years of sin on planet Earth, it takes place in the development of the 144,000. And the Millerite time period is illustrating the time period when the 144,000 are developed and therefore in agreement with the importance of the truth of the 144,000. That's why you see the Millerite time period repeated over and over and over again. Um, Sister White has statements where she talks about Daniel um, standing in the book of Revelation. She, she talks about Daniel um, being placed in the book of Revelation. In the Seventh-day Adventist, we've always understood that the book of Daniel has a certain place in Revelation where it is connected to Revelation. It's, it, Dan, the book of Daniel does not connect with the book of Revelation in chapter 1 or chapter 22. The book of Daniel connects with the book of Revelation where? We know this is Adventist. Revelation chapter 10. That's where the book of Daniel is specifically connected to the book of Revelation. This is standard understanding in Adventism. And th this is where we're going to start um, this morning's study is in Revelation 10. If you have your, your handout, it's on page 23. Um, <clears throat> you'll see, first off, the entire chapter laid out for us here in your notes. 
And uh, let's read this chapter. We're going to read a, the chapter, and then we're going to read a comment that Sister White has about this chapter in the book of Revelation, and then we're going to start dissecting the chapter and um, drawing some conclusions about this chapter. Some of the things that we're going to say about chapter 10 of Revelation are not understood in Adventism. They've never been taught in Adventism. I'm not saying that because I, I'm trying to fascinate you with new light. I'm saying that because when someone's sharing something that's new, that is more reason for your, your uh, discerning antenna to go up. It's more reason for you to be careful. So I'm, give, I'm forewarning you that some of the things we're going to say in this presentation um, have not been sounded through Adventism before. But let's read um, chapter 10 of Revelation. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, and when a, as when a lion roareth, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven, heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angels which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are, which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of, days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, and tongues, and kings. Very briefly, simply because I want to use repetition in, in, in the hopes that maybe you'll catch what I'm trying to share here today, I'm going to tell you what we're going to try to demonstrate here in this presentation before we go through and demonstrate it. The, angel, the mighty angel that comes down in these first few verses is Christ. Sister White plainly tells us so. We're going to read that in a moment. The little book that's in his hand is the book of Daniel. The fact that he put his foot upon the sea and the other foot upon the land is demonstrating that when he comes down, there is a message that's going to go around the world. That's what the sea and the earth is being symbolized by him standing upon the earth. He's going to cry with a loud voice. How does he cry? How does he cry? We just read it. With a loud voice, but what kind of loud voice? As a lion. Remember that. When he cries, he cries as a lion. That means something. We're going to deal with that. Um, I'll tell you what it means. This is the overview. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah in the book of Revelation. And it's only mentioned one time as the lion of the tribe of Judah in the book of Revelation. And where is Jesus mentioned as the lion of the tribe of Judah in the book of Revelation? It's in Revelation 5 5. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah that does what? He unseals the book. It is sealed with seven seals. So there's something we need to understand about that, about him crying as a lion. What does it mean as a lion? What does it mean that it's the lion of the tribe of Judah that does that? The seven thunders, whatever they represent, brothers and sisters, they are sealed up. You know anything else in the Bible that's sealed up? What's sealed up typically in the Bible when we talk about something being sealed up? The book of Daniel. But here we have the seven thunders sealed up. We're going to deal with that. Um, and then in the, the, the next passage, is talking about time being no longer. Brothers and sisters, prophetic time came to a conclusion on October 22, 1844. There is never to be another message in Adventism based upon prophetic time. This is Christ here that is making this announcement, and he's swearing by his heavenly Father that there will be no more messages on time after October 22, 1844. As Seventh-day Adventists, we were brought together because we were fascinated with the time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation. We have, in our genetic makeup as Adventists, the ability to consider time prophecies. That's how the Adventist church was brought together. It's from the study of time prophecies. 
But there comes a time where Jesus says, no more, no more time prophecies, but nevertheless, because of this spiritual genetic heritage that we have, we are tempted to consider time prophecies in day-for-a-day fashions here at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying here in Revelation 10, there is time no longer. That's one of the things that happens in Revelation 10. And then the seventh angel begins to sound. Who is the seventh angel? There are seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. This is the seventh. What is the mystery of God? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But brothers and sisters, if you look at this mystery of God that takes place in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it's not simply Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery of God here is dealing with the specifically and directly with the development of the 144,000. The 144,000 is the message that is connected to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. We don't understand that by and large anymore. But uh, you would be surprised if you go back to the pioneer writings in the early part of Adventism. They were on a regular and constant basis, t- basis talking about the sealing of God's people and the 144,000 and the things connected with that prophetic subject in the Bible. And here at the end of the world, we don't want to deal much with the 144,000 or the sealing because a great, for a lot of reasons, for a lot of reasons. I don't want to go down that road. We will touch on that briefly. But in the next section there, the way I have it broken up, um, we then see John commanded to go take the little book that's in the angel's hand. And here John is illustrating the Millerite time period that took the book of Daniel, came to understand it. Um, In fulfillment of their understanding, they put together this time chart. And this time chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. That's a quote from Ellen White. And this this is the fruit of John taking the little book and eating it. It was sweet in his mouth. He took the the book of Daniel, came to understand the time prophecies in the books of Daniel and Revelation, and began to proclaim this message as illustrated on this chart. But then in 1844, October 22nd, came the great disappointment, and the message in the book of Daniel becomes bitter in their stomach. And then after that whole history, it comes to the conclusion that when it's bitter in John's stomach in verse 10 there, that is October 23rd, 1844, correct? That is standard Adventist understanding. Is that correct? Is that how you understand it? What's the next verse say? You must prophesy again. Brothers and sisters, verse 11 is saying this whole history is repeated. You must do this again. Now, now upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. So I'm, I'm saying verse 11 is, is emphasizing a repeat of the Millerite time period just in that one verse. But I'm going to bring other testimony together to where you can put more than one leg upon that. So now the next passage, if you have an Ellen White study Bible, this is in Revelation 10. This particular quote from Ellen White is in the study Bible. And this is where she's dealing with Revelation 10. And we'll read this at this time. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot upon dry land, shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. I'm going to keep reading, but I want to show something to you here, if you will. Sister White says, and we read this last night, the parable of the ten virgins illustrates the experience of Adventism. Remember that quote? The parable of the ten virgins is a line of prophecy And in that history that was fulfilled from 1840 to 1844, when it comes to the parable of the ten virgins addressing that history, it's dealing with the experience of the Adventist people. But Revelation 10, we're going to show you, is dealing with that identical history, but it's not emphasizing the experience of the Advent people. What's it emphasizing? It's showing the part that Christ plays in this history. That's what we just read. Sets his foot upon dry land, shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with history. So it's the same history. We'll show you it's the same history. But the focal point of this prophetic line is what Christ, his connection with this fulfillment of the parable of ten virgins in the Millerite time period and at the end of the world. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy had waxed stronger and more determined from age to age and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. Satan, united with evil men, 
will deceive the whole world and the churches who receive not the love of the truth. But the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and authority of his voice to those who have united with Satan to oppose the truth. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Brothers and sisters, Sister White just said the seven thunders that were sealed up relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order. So what do the seven thunders represent? Future events that will be disclosed in their orders. Everyone see that? If you see that, say amen. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. Prophets do not contradict themselves. Is that what we understand? Okay, let's read on. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. John sees the little book unsealed. Then... Daniel's prophecy have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's message to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy and the other a revelation. One a book sealed, the other a book opened. John heard the mysteries which the seven thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. The special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Sister White just said the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed in their orders, and here she's saying it represents a delineation of events that transpired under the first and second angel's messages. Is she contradicting herself? When was the first angel's message? When did it come into history? That was the second angel. 1840 is the first angel's message. This is a timeline going down to the end of the world. First angel's message arrived 1840. When's the second angel message arrive? 1842. When does the third angel's message arrive? 1844. Sister White says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. She doesn't say it would transpire under the third. She's saying that the seven thunders represent the history from 1840 to 1844. But she also says the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed in their orders. Did you get that? So what is she saying? She's saying this history of 1840 to 1844 is illustrating the history at the end of the world. And this is a second line of prophecy that we're looking at that's saying the identical thing because Sister White says that this history is where the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter and that it will be fulfilled again to the very letter. Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. Brothers and sisters, the history of the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world during the development of the 144,000 and it's repeated to the very letter. You see that? You see, the, you see the reason that at least I'm making that claim. Um, reading on, the special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith, mu faith must necessarily be tested. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before their, these messages had done their specific work. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with a most solemn oath that time should be no longer. This time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither a probationary time, but a prophetic time, which should precede the advent of the Lord. That is, the people would not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. The angel's position with one foot on the sea and the other on the land signifies the wide extent, extent of the proclamation of the message. It will cross the broad waters and be proclaimed in other countries, even to, the, to all the world. The comprehension of this truth, the glad reception of the message, is represented 
in the eating of the little book. The truth in regard to time of the advent of our Lord was a precious message to our soul. So, your next quote. We're going to try to dissect Revelation 10 now with these, this commentary by Sister White. The seven thunders represent the history of 1840 to 1844. Um, more specifically, August 11th, 1844 to October 22nd, or August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. Um, we're going to try to, to nail down this specifically as we proceed. Um, you see the quote we looked at um, last night. The first angel's message arrived in 1840. It was carried to every mission station in the world. The first angel's message, a character of the first angel's message, a characteristic of the first angel's message, and this is the first angel's message here, is that it's a message that is carried to the entire world. The first angel is the first angel of Revelation 14. Sister White here is interchanging very easily um, between different prophetic histories. In Revelation 14, you have three angels. First, second, and third angels are who she's speaking of. When she deals with the first angel's message, she's emphasizing that it was a worldwide message. When you come to Revelation 10, you see a mighty angel come down. He has his foot upon the land and upon the sea. What does that symbolize? A worldwide message. The angel of Revelation 10 that comes down is Christ, but it's identifying when the first angel's message is empowered by Christ. Um, then you see the quote, 1842 is the second angel's message. Uh, the next quote, when it was proclaimed, 1843, 1844. Then in the springtime here of 1844, you have the tarrying time after the first disappointment. You'll notice here, this is the chart the Millerites were using. Um, they were predicting the, the return of the Lord in 1843, but they were using um, the calendar from the Bible. So it wasn't start there. The years they were calculating didn't begin in January and go to December. Uh, the, the year that William Miller was using ended on March 21st. So when William Miller was predicting 1843 on this chart, all the Millerites understood that he was, he was allowing 1843 to go at least till March 21st, 1844. And when March 21st passed in 1843, the tarrying time had arrived in the Millerite experience and in the parable of the ten virgins. Um, uh, and, and we looked last night briefly, we, it was one of them we didn't read, where Sister White goes into Habakkuk and Ezekiel and talks about passages of prophecy that the Millerites came to understand to explain the Tarian time. Though the vision, Terry, wait for it, for it will come. This is important information, brothers and sisters. Sister White, the Millerites had specific passages in the Bible that kept them on track during this purification process. Um, Habakkuk was one of them, Ezekiel was another one of them, and brothers and sisters, we've been told that the Millerite time period is going to be fulfilled again to what? In a vague fashion? To the very letter. So I'm saying to you, whether you're catching it or not, the prophecy in Ezekiel and Habakkuk that was so important to the Millerites has meaning for us at the end of the world that must be understood by us. It's, it, it, there's things to be said about that, even though we're not taking the time here. Now, as I explained last night, when I was um, putting these notes together, I was going very fast. Um, and in the next quote, where it says, August 11th through 17th, the midnight cry arrives, that was probably a Freudian slip, because August 11th is when the first angel's message was fulfilled. But the, the camp meeting in Exeter, where the midnight cry arrived in the history of Adventism, began on August 12th. So if you want to change that just for your own um, information, it's August 12th through 17th that that camp meeting took place. It took place near the close of the second angel's message. The close of the second angel's message is when the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd. Um, 
October 22nd, the second message closes, closes. All heaven watched with deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. But many who profess to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of their cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. What message? The first angel's message she's talking about. They hated those who loved the appearing and shut them out of the churches. When the churches shut their doors, the second angel's message had arrived. She's, and then she says, those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third message, which shows the way into the most holy place. Third angel's message arrives right here on October 22, 1844. Sister White says that the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Therefore, that time period is August 11, 1840. October 22nd, 1844. I have not made the case for August 11th yet. I've made the case for 1840. I still intend to show you why it is August 11th. But in any case, she says, seven thunders represent the history from August 11th, 1840 till October 22nd, 1844. And then she says, the seven thunders also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. Um, she, she noted in her, the passage that we read, that Daniel was going to stand in his lot. Um, let me see if I put the quote in here. I'm thinking maybe I didn't. There's a quote where Sister White says, this, Daniel standing in, uh, standing in his lot, this is a paraphrase, the words aren't coming to me word for word like they do sometimes. To stand in the lot means to fulfill one's purpose. There, there's many discussions about what, when Daniel stands in his lot, what does it mean? To stand in his, in his lot can mean that you've entered into the judgment time. When, when my name comes up in the heavenly judgment, I am standing in my lot. Another thing that can be meant by standing in the lot is standing in your grave at the resurrection, your lot, the place you were buried or the place you were laid to rest, however you were laid to rest. But Sister Wright also says to stand in a lot is when a man fulfills his purpose. So when we're talking about Daniel standing in his lot, in, da in Daniel and Revelation, we're talking about the book of Daniel fulfilling its purpose. It had a purpose. Um, and Sister White is going to deal with this. Um, here's a few thoughts on Daniel standing in his lot on page 26. The first one is that he has a proper place. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of days. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecy have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was a message in relation to time. Next quote, same quote, but what we want to emphasize here is that the unsealing of the little book. What's the little book? What's the little book that's unsealed here? The book of Daniel. In Revelation 10, it was, it, was, it was a message in the book of Daniel, not a message. It was a message on time. It was a time prophecy. Daniel, the book of Daniel had a specific place in the history of 1840 to 44. And what do I mean by a specific place? Here, to give you an example, the Millerites did not come to understand the time prophecies in the book of Daniel on October 22, 1844. They understood the time prophecies back here before 1840. The, the time prophecies in the book of Daniel have their proper place in this history. They were understood at the beginning, not at the end. You follow me? They have their proper place. And the message in the book of Daniel that is unsealed is a message in relation to time, a time prophecy in the book of Daniel. See the logic of my argument, even though you may not agree with it at this point? Um, the next quote, Daniel stands in his lot when a time prophecy is unsealed. This is, this is the, the development that I'm trying to make here. He stands 
It says, Daniel shall stand at, in his lot at the end of the days. In Daniel 12, he's promised, there's a promise given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, 12, that at the end of the days he shall stand in his lot. Now this time prophecy is in verse 12. It comes right after verses 10 and 11. And what are verses 10 and 11? It's the, the 1290 day prophecy and the 1335 day prophecy. And those two time prophecies are only broken up by a few verses where Daniel's speaking with, um, with Gabriel. And right before this conversation, we see Christ saying um, times, times, and dividing the time until the power of the holy people has been scattered. And the point is this. In this final passage of Daniel 12, Daniel's seen time prophecies. He sees the 1260, then he sees the 1290, and then he sees the 1335, and then in the last verse in the book of Daniel, there's a promise saying, Daniel, go thy way, because you will stand in your lot. You will fulfill your purposes at the end of the days. By the context of the passage, what does the end of the days mean? The end of the time prophecies. Those time prophecies are days. When those time prophecies come to its conclusion, then Dan the book of Daniel will fulfill its purpose in Revelation 10. Um, next quote isn't from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. It's from Testimonies to Ministers 115. It says, Daniel stood in his lot. Now remember, we've read a quote here where S Sister White says, Daniel stands in his lot, and he has a proper place in the first, second, third angel's message. There's a specific place where Daniel stands up and fulfills his purpose. And then here in this quote, Sister White says, Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end, when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to the world. So I ask you, when did Daniel stand in his lot? When the first angel's message was proclaimed to the world. When was the first angel's message proclaimed to the world? In eight, well, if you go back to 1833, when Miller, William Miller received his credentials, it began to be proclaimed, but it was empowered on August 11th, 1840. That's when it was carried to the world. That's when Christ came down and put his foot upon the, sand, the sea and his foot upon the earth. And the Millerites prior to 1840 had already published the tracks of the Millerite message they were setting in the ports on the east and the west coast, ready in 1840 to be carried to the world. And they were. Daniel stood in his lot here at the beginning. This is, this is important to mark. Daniel standing in his lot it has its proper place in the first, second, and third angel's message. You'll see why this is important as we go forward. What time prophecy arrived in 1840? And we, we read part of this last night from Great Controversy 334 to 335. The time prophecy that arrived in 1840 was the time prophecy of Revelation 9.15. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The collapse of the power of Islam. In the book of Revelation, there are three powers that come from the bottomless pit. You could also say that Satan is associated with the bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. But in terms of three earthly powers, there are three earthly powers that come from the bottomless pit. Islam is one of them. Revelation 8 comes, the smoke that comes up out of the bottomless pit is Islam. Atheism comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11. And Catholicism comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 17, verse 8. There are only three powers that come out of the bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. And on August 11th, 1840, one of the powers in Bible prophecy that came out of the bottomless pit came to its end in fulfillment of a time prophecy found in Revelation 9, verse 15. And this is what empowered the Millerite message. This is what empowered the first angel's message. This is when Christ came down out of heaven with the book of Daniel opened in his hand and the message was carried to the world. Um, so what we're saying is, is, when it comes to the first angel's message, the evidence is that Daniel's 
stood on his lot, what we just read, I, I'm maybe going too fast for you early in the morning, where Daniel stood in his lot in a specific place. He has his proper place, Sister White says. And the unsealing of the book of Daniel, she says, was a message in relation of time. And she says that Daniel stood in his lot in 1840. So you have to ask the question, what time prophecy was unsealed in 1840 that empowered the book of Daniel? And it's the time prophecy of Revelation 9.15. Therefore, if you're going to get very specific, the first angel's message was empowered on August 11th, 1840. Not simply 1840. It was empowered when the Ottoman Empire collapsed on that date. Follow the logic? Yes? No? Okay. First angel's message arrived on August 11, 1840 on page 27. Sister White says, Any question that Satan can arouse in the mind to create doubt in regard to the grand history of the past travels of the people of God will please his satanic majesty and is an offense to God. The tidings of the Lord's soon coming in power and great glory to our world is truth, and in 1840, many voices were raised in its proclamation. Brothers and sisters, if you go to the quote before this, from Great Controversy 334 to 335, where Sister White's talking about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and that Josiah Litch had made this prediction based upon Revelation 9.15, you would not believe how many fanaticisms, different fanaticisms, there are in Adventism that attack these two verses from the Great Controversy. They attack that truth. Some people actually teach that Uriah Smith snuck those two paragraphs into the Great Controversy to support his ideas. I mean, that's actually taught in Adventism. Why? Because anything Satan can do to attack the truth of the Millerite time period, when this message was carried to the world, he attempts to do. There is, there is teachings in Adventism that the, the Greek of Revelation 9.15 cannot be interpreted to be 391 years and 15 days. There's all kinds of arguments against this truth. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, it's an attempt to destroy this sacred history which is the foundation of Adventism and also the capstone of Adventism. You may not have considered it before, but I want to emphasize to you at least my conviction. When we're dealing with this history, we are on sacred ground. This history is just as sacred as the deliverance from Egypt was to ancient Israel. We need to be straight about this, and we need to understand that there are those among us that do not understand these things that purposely attempt to destroy these things these truths. And if you may not be aware of it, but they're out there. So the seven thunders that were sealed up cover this history. October, August 11th, 1840, October 22nd, 1844. Um, they represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. Uh, well, a principle that we started with last night in our first presentation is Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. You can see a couple quotes there um, to go along with that. And one that I forewarned you last night, we're going to refer to quite a bit this weekend. It's the next quote, a subject of great consequence. Some prophecies God has repeated, thus showing that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great, great consequence. Brothers and sisters, this history here we dealt with last night was a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. That's a prophecy about this history. This history here is the history of the seven thunders, Revelation chapter 10, a second prophecy of the same history. And as we've been dealing with this, we've been, we've been showing that this history was a fulfillment of the three angels' messages, which is Revelation 14. We've been dealing with three different prophetic lines. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. And there are other prophetic lines that you overlay on this. So the Lord is confirming um, the importance of this. Um, line upon line, the parable of the ten virgins has been, will be repeated to the very letter. Page 28, the parable of the ten virgins, Sister White says, illustrates the experience of Adventism. I have found that, uh, that 
most of us in Adventism have not been the students of prophecy that we should be. And that's unfortunate because we've all been told we're supposed to be students of prophecy. The first quote in this book you can look at, every Seventh-day Adventist is to be a student of prophecy. It's not the only place that we're told that. Once we take up the work of being a student of prophecy, then there's many things to learn in the school of prophecy. And um, one of those things is that God is not redundant. God doesn't repeat things over and over again to make the same point. When God repeats something, it's because the second time he's saying it, he's adding more light to the first time. And the third time he repeats it, he's adding more light. He doesn't just repeat things for the sake of repeating things. So what I hope you're seeing is Sister White has told us the parable of the ten virgins, which is this prophetic line of history. The parable of the ten virgins illustrates the experience of Adventism. Here's a a truth about this history about the experience of God's people, whereas Revelation 10 isn't so much dealing about the experience of Adventism, although it's in there. You can see the disappointment when it becomes bitter in John's stomach. But the primary focus of Revelation 10 is emphasizing the part that Christ plays in this history. Um, so, if you have a pen, I, I want to make a change here. The next one is the seven thunders. The seven thunders represent events. Whether Sister White says they represent future events that will be disclosed in their order or a delineation of events that would transpire in the first and second angel's message, the seven thunders represent events in both circumstances. That's what she said. I'm not dogmatic about these seven events. Uh, don't hold me to this. It's not important to me to, to, to win an argument about this. And I want to make a, a, a change on it. The third, these seven events, August 11th, 1840, first angel's message arrives. Second event, second angel's message, 1842. And then the third event, I have 1843, second angel's message proclaimed. What I would do if, you, if I were you is put summer 1844. We have the quote, Sister White says, summer 1844, the second angel's message was proclaimed. And I would move that down to number five and bring number four up to three and number five up to four. And then the fourth is the first disappointment, March 21st, 1844. This, the tarrying time is part of the, the parable of the ten virgins. It arrives in the spring of 1844. Then the midnight cry, August 12th, not 11th, August 12th to 17th at the Exeter camp meeting is where this midnight cry came into history. And then, of course, the great disappointment. Um, underneath that, the little book that opened is the book of Daniel. Um, notice on the bottom of page 28, the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Notice this very carefully, brothers and sisters. We have, as had John, a message to bear of the things which we have seen and heard. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. We don't have a new message. So what was the message in 1843 and 1844 that they were proclaiming? Was it the health message? No. Was it the sanctuary message? No. Was it country living? No. Was it true education? No. What was the message that was proclaimed in 1843 and 1844 that is still our message? It's illustrated right here, brothers and sisters. Every Millerite preacher had this chart. This chart is actually the one they had is about the size of this here. Maybe not as long, and it, would, it was top down. It was from about here to here and about this wide. Every Millerite mess preacher had this 1843 chart. This is the message that they were proclaiming that brought the people out of the churches. And what did we just read? We don't have any new message. Here we are at the end of the world. We're supposed to be proclaiming this, question, this message. Let me ask you a question. How many of you today are prepared to go out and give a Bible study on this part of this chart? Do you see what I'm pointing to? The 2520. What's the longest time prophecy in the Bible? Usually when you ask Seventh-day Adventists, they'll say the 2300 days. But the longest time prophecy in the Bible is the 2520, which is part of the, the 1843 chart. And we have no new message. And you ask Seventh-day Adventists what they understand about the 2520. 
And usually they don't even know it's a time prophecy. And I'm not speaking down to anyone. I'm saying that this is, this is illustrated in Revelation chapter 10. Why? Why am I saying that? Revelation chapter 10 teaches, brothers and sisters, that the seven thunders represent this history from 1840 to 1844. And part of this history is that this was the message of this history. This was the message that was being proclaimed in this history that brought the people out of the churches. But what happened to this history? What happened to it? What happened to it in verse 4 of Revelation 10? It was sealed up, brothers and sisters. It was sealed up, and at the end of the world, God's people do not know this history. They don't know the foundations of Adventism, not because we are necessarily, you know, uneducated or stupid or anything like that. The way we have to relate to it is that inspiration has told us this is sealed up. Now, brothers and sisters, in the Millerite time period, one of the characteristics that takes place is that there was an increase of knowledge when a book was unsealed in the Millerite time period. What was that book? The book of Daniel, right? was unsealed. But that history is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world. And you know what? There's something that has been sealed up to God's people that gets unsealed at the end of the world. And you know what it is? It's the seven thunders. It's this history. It's this message. There has to be an unsealing at the end if we're going to perfectly fulfill the history of the beginning. In the beginning, the books of Daniel were unsealed. At the end, the only thing that's been sealed up until the end of the world is verse 4 of Revelation 10. Notice the next quote. I have seen that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and it should not be altered. That some of the figures were as he that the figures were as he wanted them that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures. She's saying there was some mistakes in this chart. One of the classic ones we understand is right here. The 2300 days ending in 1843. God put his hand over that. There's, but she, does, she doesn't say figure in the singular. She says figures in the plural. There's a few mistakes on this chart. But nevertheless, this was prepared by God and should not be altered. And we don't have any new message. This is our message. How many of you know that James White was legally blind when he was a child? James White was one of the most powerful Millerite preachers there, or there were. He was legally blind, couldn't go to school. He wanted to go to school, but he couldn't go to school. And then when he was about 18 or 19, his sight returned to him, and he went to school, and he mastered kindergarten to high school in just a matter of weeks. Before he was out of high school, he was already teaching other children. All he wanted to do was go to college. He was hungering for education making plans to get some money to go to college. And his mother says to him, you need to go hear this preacher down the road. So he, being an obedient son, he went and heard this preacher. Who do you suppose the preacher was? Miller. William Miller. He come, becomes convicted that he needs to present this message that William Miller is presenting. So he came home. He makes covenant with the Lord. I'm going to present this message. And he immediately he gets invitations to go present this message. And after a couple weeks labor, you know what he discovered? He was a complete an utter failure. So you know what he did? He took this chart and he went into his bedroom and he put it on the wall and for a week he memorized that chart in relation to the Bible until he knew that chart. And then he went out and became one of the most powerful Millerite preachers. We have no new message. This is the message. This was directed by the hand of the Lord. This is the foundations of Adventism. Yes, the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the second coming, the state of the dead are foundational truths. But the foundations of Adventism are laid upon the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation that are reflected on this chart. You'll see some quotes on page 29 that tell us we don't have any more message of time. You'll see then... On the bottom of page 29, the sounding of the seventh angel. The sounding of the seventh angel is something that is present truth. It's present truth for today. And uh, the development of the 144,000 takes place during the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And it is a subject that we need to understand. 
And if you'll notice in verse 7 where it talks about the seventh trumpets, it says in verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. There are only a handful of truths in the Bible that the Bible says that all the, sir, all the prophets spoke about. There's, no, there's only a handful of truths that all the prophets deal with. One of them you know. What did Jesus say about the scriptures? These are they that what? That testify of me. Jesus is one of the truths that all the prophets spoke about. There's only a handful of them. Another of the truths that all the prophets spoke about, brothers and sisters, was the development of the 144,000. And so you'll find a supplemental um, Bible study to this presentation, I'm not going to go over, that goes through and shows you prophet after prophet that are dealing with the development of the 144,000. And when you bring their testimony together, it teaches that at the end of the world, God is going to have a church that has sinners and righteous mixed together. And in uh, Ezekiel, when he's dealing with it, he calls them rebels. It's, the prophets teach there comes a point in time where God is going to purify his church by removing the rebels. That's Ezekiel's words. And then the prophets teach with that purified church, God will use that church to reflect his glory, the prophets teach, and they will go out and gather others unto him. That is the sequence of events that is associated with the development of the 144,000. They are developed from a church that ha is a mixture of wheat and tares. There's a purification process that takes place where the wheat stand alone with the seal of God, and they then go out and bring those outside of Adventism in amongst them. And you'll see this study, this partial study, at the end of this presentation. And I have some more things to say about this presentation, but we'll have to put them at the beginning of the next presentation uh, because we've ran out of time. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the time this morning to consider these great truths. And Lord... It appears that in verse 4 of Revelation 10, you sealed up the seven thunders and that these represent a history that we need to understand here at the end of the world. I ask that you'd give us discernment to understand what it means that you sealed this history up and what, more importantly, it means that you unseal it here at the end of time. We want to understand these things correctly in an intelligent fashion where we can Share them in a convincing and winning way to those around us. And we thank you for uh, bringing us together this Sabbath morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>